Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the first day of War Water Week 2024. Uh, my name is Melissa Melpignano. I'm part of the organizing committee, and it's my pleasure to introduce you today to Sergio Samaniego. Sergio Samaniego has been with the Center for Environmental Resource Management at UTEP since 2020 and serves as the assistant manager at the Rio Bosque Wetlands Park, which is a 372-acre city of El Paso Park found next to the Rio Grande in El Paso's Mission Valley. At the park, UTEP and its many collaborators are working on establishing examples of historic river valley wetland ecosystems once found along the Rio Grande. Sergio enjoys all things outdoors and is part of the artist-led collective Somos Agua, We Are Water, acts as the West Texas representative for the Texas chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration and is a member of the Frontera Land Alliance Lands and the Water, and Water Committee. His training is in environmental science uh, with a concentration in fresh water invertebrates with a degree uh, from UTEP. And his interests include wetlands, restoration ecology, and deserts, and let me anticipate beavers, I believe. As you'll explain today in your talk entitled Actions of Care and Stewardship at the Rio Bosque Wetlands Park, let's welcome Sergio Samaniego. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Sergio Samaniego. Um, like Melissa mentioned, I work for the Center for Environmental Resource Management. Um, and today I'm going to go over, um, I'm going to give you an inside look at the ecological restoration process at Rio Bosque. Um, a few of the challenges we face with water availability and the management of invasive and exotic species. Um, and I'll also be highlight highlighting a few of the park residents along the way. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in El Paso. Um, I lived most of my life in uh, Far East El Paso, but I didn't know that Rio Bosque existed. Um, like many people that live in El Paso, um, I didn't know that Rio Bosque existed until I took a field-based environmental science course that taught us various field sampling methods. Um, so Rio Bosque is a 372-acre city of El Paso Park that is managed by us at the Center for Environmental Resource Management. Um, El Paso Water and the city's public service board administer the park and provide water. We also receive some water from the El Paso County Water Improvement District Number 1, which is our uh, local irrigation district. And Rio Bosque was created as a mitigation project um, for um, the American, American Canal Extension Project uh, in the 1990s. So historically, a wide bend of um, the Rio Grande wound through what is today Rio Bosque Wetlands Park. Um, so if you were to visit the park today, you'd have the ability to walk up and down a historic portion of the historic uh, Rio Grande. Um, so you'd be able to walk uh, up and down the old river channel um, and experience how um, river valley ecosystems once used to be. Uh, the natural flow of the Rio Grande all changed uh, with the construction of the Elephant Butte Dam and Reservoir in 1916. Um, the construction of this project completely changed the way um, the water from the Rio Grande moved through this region. So the natural movement of the Rio Grande uh, before the Elephant Butte Dam was built was um, made its way through this region. Uh, it would meander and wind through the valley, um, making new depressions along the way. Uh, we would receive these uh, very high spring uh, snow peak uh, melts in May and June from uh, the San Juan Mountains in Colorado. Um, and they would make their way down through the valley. Um, and along the way, they would pick up 
uh, native cottonwood and willow seeds uh, that would eventually germinate and turn into cottonwood uh, and willow bosques. Uh, in other areas, you'd get uh, wetland areas um, that would support lots of animals. Um, and it would just be this in incredibly rich ecosystem um, with very diverse habitats. Um, but that's all gone ever since the Rio Grande was channelized in the 1930s. And that's what we're trying to bring back at Rio Bosque. We're trying to bring back um, approximate examples of river valley ecosystems that once were found uh, in the river valley. So since the natural flows of the Rio Grande don't make their way through uh, the park anymore. We have to rely on other sources of water. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the valves at cell one. Um, and this is water from the Roberto Bustamante wastewater treatment plant. That's where we receive most of our water from the Bustamante plant. We also rely on irrigation water. So during irrigation season, we receive um, irrigation water, and this is a picture of the turnout that's connected directly to uh, the Riverside Canal, and that's how we pump water into the park. And we also rely on groundwater. Uh, we have two windmills that produce around five gallons of water per minute, um, and those feed directly into certain areas that would go dry uh, if it wasn't for those uh, two windmills. And we also have two electric pumps that produce um, 300 to 450 gallons per minute, and those are fed directly into the Old River Channel. So this is a uh, table with the typical water availability we have at the park uh, throughout the year. On the x-axis, you can see uh, the months, um, and on the y-axis, you have the water deliveries to the park uh, by the millions of gallons. You can see that we receive most of the water, uh, our, the largest amount of water from the Bustamante plant in late fall, early winter. Then for February and March, we have to rely on uh, solely the groundwater pumps and the windmills. And then we start receiving some groundwater um, which is a nice addition. And then we have a nice combination of groundwater, uh, irrigation water, and uh, Bustamante plant water um, from May to September. So once the water is uh, pumped into the park, either through the Bustamante plant pipelines or uh, the turnout at the Riverside Canal, um, we have to uh, find ways to divert it to certain parts of the park. So to do that, um, uh, we rely on several gates that allow us to either uh, open the gates or close them, um, depending on where the, we want the water to go. For example, um, when we receive water from the Bustamante plant, um, which is right n next door to the park. It comes through a pipeline and then to an outlet at the inlet portion of the park, and it runs through the old river channel. Once it gets to the gates, we have um, the ability to either send some to cell one, or if we want to want to focus on uh, flooding other areas of the park, we uh, can send it down gate four and allow the downstream portion of the park to flood a little bit more, um, and so on and so forth. We can use gate three to pump more water into cell three, cell two, I'm sorry. Um, so we just regular regularly make adjustments depending on what portion of the park we want to flood, and also depending on the amount of water we have. So this is a picture of the Rio Bosque in the early um, years of the project. Uh, this picture was taken early 1998 um, when the wetland project was 
uh, started. All the blank banks were cleared of any vegetation. Uh, the old river channel was channelized to prepare it for water. Um, so you can see that there's no uh, plant vegetation. Um, you can just see a few uh, mesquites in the background. No, so this is the old river channel inside the park. And this is how it looks now. Uh, you can see a nice combination of uh, cottonwoods, uh, Gooding's willows, uh, willow baccarat, jackass clover. Uh, on the website, on the CERM website, we have a series of uh, repeat photography. Um, in 1997, we set up uh, uh, 28 photo stations where we take um, pictures of different sites throughout the park at different times of the year. Um, and you can see uh, how the park has changed over, over time um, if you visit that website. So Rio Bosque is really important, um, not only as a natural place where um, animals uh, can use as habitat, um, but the community can come together and uh, enjoy nature, uh, come together as a community and work on different types of projects. Um, the community can also learn about um, their natural resources and um, just overall just relax and um, take some time off from being surrounded by concrete jungles. At the park, we have uh, over 100 native plant species. Um, these are a few of pic pictures I've taken over the years. Um, just while I'm working, um, I see a pretty flower and stop and, and take a picture of it. Uh, so we have a purple nightshade um, in the far left, a sacred datura in the middle, um, a choya in full bloom, and a spectacle pod. So the spect spectacle pod has like little leaves that look like glasses. Um, and I, th I think it's a really cool plant. We also have uh, sand prickly pears. Uh, these are found in sandy soils. They form these creeping mats of cacti. They're pretty inconspicuous. You might not even see them clearly in this, uh, this photo, but they produce these really cool yellow flowers. Uh, when they bloom, I took this one um, around May last year. So there's plenty of opportunities to um, take pictures of flowers and any other plants you might like at the Rio Bosque. We also have uh, these park residents. Uh, these are a few of the animals that we have at the Rio Bosque. We have a checkered garter snake uh, on the top left a Texas horned lizard that looks like it came out of a Harry Potter movie um, with all the spikes. Uh, we have a spiny softshell turtle. Rio Bosque is also home to uh, many mammals. Uh, here pictured, we have a, um, a coyote jumping over a willow and a uh, raccoon staring back at his reflection. Um, So this picture here is pretty special to me because it was the first time I ever saw a bobcat at the park. Um, I'd heard stories when I started working at the park that there were bobcats, but I had never seen one. Um, it took me six months to see the first bobcat. Um, by working there every day, it took me six months. Uh, and all I had with me was uh, my old cracked uh, iPhone XR. So that's why the quality is kind of low. And But it's a real sp special picture because that's when I first saw a bobcat in the wild. This is a better photo that was caught on one of our trail cams. Um, it's also a bobcat. I don't know if it's the same one. I've only seen two at a time out at the park. And then this one was taken um, by me also uh, maybe a month ago. 
I was driving into the park and um, making my way uh, to check the groundwater wells. And I spotted something furry and big and uh, chunky in one of the limbs. Um, so I stopped to take a closer look with my binoculars and there it was. It was a bobcat. It let me get really close. Um, I took that picture with uh, my binoculars and my phone. So if you're interested in wildlife photography and are intimidated by not having expensive cameras, I mean, you really don't need anything but some patience and um, some luck and just go out there and have fun and look for stuff to take pictures of. We also have lots of birds. Um, so Rio Bosque is one of the top birding spots in El Paso. Um, at the beginning of the wetland project, we only had um, 107 documented birds. Uh, now we're up to over 260. Um, I, I want to say we're at 262. Um, yeah, for, for water birds, we're, uh, we started with 70 and now we're up to, we started with 20, I'm sorry. And now we're over 79, um, water birds. Yeah. And pictured here are, is a group of red tails, um, one of them is a Harland hawk, not too sure, the darker one. Uh, this is a picture of a white-tailed white kite. Uh, it's a beautiful raptor that's nested in the Rio Bosque before. Uh, this is a group of sandhill cranes um, taking a pit stop at cell one, which is our largest cell. This is a picture of a loggerhead shrike, a really cute bird. Um, you've probably been around the desert and have seen uh, insects or lizards impaled in like barbed wire or um, branches. So that was probably this guy um, setting them out to dry for, for lunch later. And then this is a picture of a great blue heron on top of the border wall, which has eventually just turned into the park, uh, whether we like it or not. It's it's um, a feature that's very impactful uh, when people from out of town visit the park. Um, they get amazed at how close we are to the border since we're right next to it. And this is a black crown night heron uh, staring back at me um, along the old river channel. So a large portion of our job at the Rio Bosque is vegetation management. Um, we have to continuously uh, prune the uh, working trails. Uh, when trees start becoming too overgrown, we have to start pruning them. Um, lots of uh, invasive species removal. There's a tumbleweed there in the corner that we just removed um, before we took the after photo. Um, the growth of the vegetation varies from year to year. Uh, some years there's more overgrown vegetation than others. But the most physically taxing uh, portion of my job at the Rio Bosque, uh, in my opinion, is mowing the wetland cells. So in preparation uh, for our largest allocation of water, um, in the late fall, early winter, we have to uh, clear the wetland cells because they go dry throughout uh, the time of year when we're not receiving as much water as we do in the winter. And this is a machine we use. Um, it's a DR walk behind brush mower. Uh, it's a simple tool. Um, you add gasoline and uh, pull the trigger and walk behind it and push it through the vegetation. Um, but it takes hours. Uh, we usually start mowing around August and finish before our uh, the largest water deliveries are uh, during December. So this is a before shot 
of the left side of cell two. Um, you can see that there's just tons of vegetation. Um, you can kind of see the the cottonwood back there um, uh, over the brush. Um, and the amount of vegetation varies from year to year. Um, I want to say that this, uh, the height of this vegetation uh, in that picture was over my head. So over six feet tall, sometimes it gets over six feet tall. And that's the after. Um, so it's uh, ready for water. You can see that if we were not to mow the wetland cells, uh, there would no, be no open space for uh, waterfowl to land and feed on or, or gather nest. So we have to make it more favorable for for the animals to to come to the park. Here's another example. Uh, this is uh, in cell one. I remember this day clearly because it was really hot and uh, the um, vegetation was really tough to get through. Um, there's lots of smart weed, which is just a vine viney wetland plant uh, that's very uh, difficult to cut through with a mower. So that's a before and after. Uh, this is a spot at cell one uh, next to a Western screech owl, screech owl nest box. Uh, again, the before and after, and then flooded um, when we received the the uh, allocations from the Rio the Bustamante wastewater treatment plant. Now, so with the uh, the brush mower, it just cuts it up it to yeah to to mulch yeah. Um, this is the right side of uh, cell two. Tons of vegetation. This wasn't too difficult to cut through, but very time consuming. Uh, that's the after, nice and clear. And then flooded, um, ready for birds to come in. Lois Balin from Texas Parks and Wildlife also works on uh, studying the nesting patterns of uh, burrowing owls at the park. Uh, she noticed that um, the owls weren't nesting as much as they used to. Um, and she thought that it might be because their uh, burrowing owl networks were getting encroached by uh, vegetation. As you can see, there's tons of tumbleweeds and um, four-wing saltbush and other vegetation is really close to um, their nest boxes. So we went ahead and cleared those. And I'm gonna show off a few uh, pictures of some cute burrowing owls. That's me handling one of the owls, uh, looking almost as cute as the owl, but not, re but not really. And then that's a closer look. So, so all the hard work usually um, pays off when you know that you're doing it for uh, for something bigger than yourself. At the Rio Bosca, we also struggle a lot with um, invasive species. So pictured here is uh, um, the salt cedar. Salt cedars have a really deep root system that soak up a lot of uh, groundwater. Uh, when they shed their seeds, they also uh, produce mats of very salty uh, ground that don't allow any other plant that's native to the area to grow. So we work on removing it little by little. Um, there's a few stands left behind at the Rio Bosque. Uh, they were left behind when the uh, wetland project had just started. Um, so not completely rid of the park of uh, useful bird habitat. So now that native vegetation has started to come up, we have um, been removing the salt cedar little by little as time permits. Uh, this is during a uh, community work day. As you can see, those are all the chopped up limbs. We usually use uh, hand tools to cut down the trees. Uh, lots of fleshy materials. Um, what we do with most of this vegetation is 
um, use it as uh, erosion control along the old river channel, or um, we use the larger limbs to mark the trails. Um, and that's how we kind of reuse everything we, we take down. This is how the stump looks um, after it's been completely cut down. Um, we usually just make one final cut uh, at the base of the tree and then treat it with an herbicide car called garlon oil. And that um, that stuns their uh, metabolic processes and, and kills the tree. We also struggle a lot with uh, another invasive exotic species uh, known as the famous tumbleweed um, that most of you have seen if you're from here. There's a few of them flying around there in this picture. Um, once they're dry, they get, they do their job very, very well. Um, so they, they're these huge fears that just go airborne with any opportunity they have. Um, this is a picture of them uh, clogging the river channel. So when they clog the river channel, they don't allow the water to flow through. So we have to go in there and uh, dig them out by hand. What we usually do with these is uh, that we we pile them up into a compost pile. Uh, we have various compost piles scattered around the park. And uh, we let them degrade over time. Um, I think John experienced uh, burning them at some point, but he stopped because the fire got out of control. So the fire department told them he couldn't do that anymore. So um, we don't burn the tumbleweeds anymore. Just like the removal of invasive and exotic species, we also establish um, native vegetation at the Rio Bosque. I'm gonna go over um, our pole planting methods, which we typically do during uh, the winter months. So that runs usually from December to March. Those are the best times to plant the trees because they're uh, completely dormant and it allows the poles to produce a root system. Um, so they're ready when for when growing season starts. At Rio Bosque, we work on establishing the Rio Grande Cottonwood and the Goodings Willow. And what we do is that we uh, harvest poles from existing uh, trees. So for example, that pole that John's holding right there on this picture uh, came from that cottonwood that's directly behind him. So we search for the longest, uh, straightest poles um, that have the ability to reach groundwater. So we have various methods of uh, making the hole for the pole plantings. This is Kayla, one of our interns um, that's preparing a hole with a hand auger. Um, and the hand, hand auger is used with uh, smaller poles or uh, smaller trees that don't need to go as deep or have as a big of a hole um, to fit in the ground. We have the ability of going up to 18 feet deep with a hand auger. And that's a picture of the hand dogger. So essentially what it is, is a, uh, a sphere with uh, two claws at the end of it that you twist around and uh, it lets you take out a, a soil core and you keep on going down until you hit, hit groundwater. When we have bigger trees with a larger diameter or, um, or it's just weirdly shaped and it's Squiggly, we have the ability to produce 12-inch uh, diameter holes with uh, this machine called the Little Beaver. Um, and it's much more difficult to carry around and uh, everything's really heavy and um, it's much more of an operation than the hand auger. Now, so this is to put in the pole plantings, yeah. So for example, here, this is during a work day. Um, 
the community uh, was working on making a hole. Um, so we go in as deep uh, until we hit groundwater. You can see the groundwater seeping through the hole. Um, I want to say that's around six feet. It, it, yeah, so it depends. Um, right there, we're really, as you can see, we're close to the old river channel. So there's plenty of water seeping through there. So in some areas, we'd have to go much deeper to hit groundwater. But since we're so close to water there, it was only about two extensions worth, which are three feet each. Once we see the groundwater, um, we stop there and stab the, the pole planting into the, the ground. Um, and then we cover it back up, tamper it nicely. So when we water it, um, the well doesn't break and uh, the water falls through the hole. Um, so when we establish the pole plantings, it doesn't only come to, uh, we don't only just plant the tree and then forget about it. Uh, like any living thing, they require a lot of attention. Um, so when we're establishing the pole plantings, um, we try to water them at least every other day uh, during the summer. Sometimes every day if it's really hot. Um, a few days after we plant the tree, we also add some rooting solution to promote um, the root growth of the tree. And then along the way, if they're not doing too well, we add uh, fertilizer when needed. Uh, in the fall, um, watering is reduced a bit, maybe to once or twice a week. And in the winter, we usually only water it once. Uh, this is done for most of the time, the first year, sometimes the second, uh, and sometimes even more than that. And so they require a lot of attention and uh, dedication from us to keep them going. Uh, when there's water right next to the uh, old river channel, there's nothing better to grab water with than the trusty old five gallon bucket. So we just dip some buckets into the, the water and, and water the tree that way. But there's been other cases where um, things go a lot drier than uh, we expect. For example, for uh, in 2022, the only water source we had at the park were the two groundwater pumps, like I said, that produced around 300 to 450 gallons per minute. And they were only um, keeping those two areas in the dark blue uh, moist. Everything else along the old river channel and in the cells uh, went completely dry. And that's a picture of the old river channel inside the park uh, with no water at all. So what we had to do um, to keep trees alive during that late uh, water delivery season um, was build uh, wells around mature trees that were looking extremely stressed. So we went around and looked for the trees that looked most stressed and built some wells around uh, the base of the trees. And we had to rent a 500 gallon um, generator and a tank uh, that allowed us to bring water from the Bustamante plant into the trees and uh, feed it to them that way um, until we started receiving water again in, in late June. We also rely on this uh, water bladder that we carry in the back of John's truck. It's all leaky and and uh, old and teared up, but it does the trick. It holds around 275 gallons of water. Um, and if we want to water uh, poles during a time when there's not much water available, we usually uh, fill this tank up at the Roberto Bustamante Wastewater Treatment Plant and um, fill up buckets and uh, water the trees that way. There's times where we try to establish trees um, in areas that 
are pretty remote or there's no access uh, by vehicle. So we have to uh, carry the water uh, to that area. So when we started receiving water again, after that extremely dry time in uh, May, 2022, it started coming in through uh, the inlet pipeline, which is pictured right here. So to keep the water inside the park, we have earthen dams, which are just dams uh, um, that make their way across the old river channel and keep the water inside the park. So this is a picture of the earthen dam that keeps the water inside the park. Um, and this is the pipeline that's feeding water into it. But we noticed that uh, when we started receiving water, um, the water wasn't making its way downstream like we're used to. Um, and we were wondering what was going on. Uh, we weren't too sure what was happening. And um, while we were making our rounds through the park, we noticed that the earthen dam that holds the water inside the park uh, had broken, um, as you can see there. So we were losing most of the water we were getting from the Bustamante plant. Um, so we had to ask for help from El Paso Water to bring in a front end loader to uh, patch up the dam. And we didn't know what was going on, why the water wasn't moving through the park like it usually does. Um, until a Saturday uh, morning when John discovered um, in that spot where that green circle popped up that there was a beaver dam holding up the water. So that's the picture of the first beaver dam uh, ever at the park at Rio Bosque. Um, it's a massive structure that was holding back all of the water that we were receiving from the Bustamante plant. Uh, so we, uh, decided to set up some trail cams and see what we would find. And that's the little guy that was causing all the trouble. Um, yeah. And I brought down one of his souvenirs. Uh, so this is, um, a tree limb that it chewed up. You can clearly see the markings here. I'm going to pass it around so you guys can see it. Um, I know that. I'm from El Paso and I had never seen one of these um, in person. So maybe a lot of you have never seen a, a beaver chewed up tree. So I decided to bring it down so you can get a better idea of its teeth. And it's really cute, but it's a, it causes a lot of trouble. We think it's just one. So we've only, we've only captured one on the trail cams. Um, we're up to six dams now along the old river channel. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was more than one, but we can only, uh, say that there's one so far because that's all we've caught on the trail comes. That's a picture of the sixth dam it built. You can see John is waiting on the other side, uh, with knee deep water. Uh, and I'm, on the dry section. Um, uh, we think it's only one. Like I said, we've only been able to capture one on the trail cam, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's more than one uh, because it's there's lots of dams. Yeah. Um, and they just create these really intricate uh, structures where they weave all the plant material together and stack up mud and that doesn't look like a big deal to you but um like i said i'm standing on the dry portion of it and it probably reached up to my thigh so it's a huge structure that it built yeah i bet yeah and there's some uh some examples of the damage uh, it'd be nice if it went after like the invasive and exotic species we try to remove, but it usually likes eating the uh, native cottonwoods and willows. You can see that those have taken a pretty good beating. Yeah, and that's that's where we think it lives. So there's a den uh, 
with a pretty big hole uh, along the old river channel uh, where we think it's stationed. Um, but we we haven't seen it go in uh, or seen it come out from there. So we're still kind of iffy. We need to set up a camera there. So what we did to remediate this issue of the water not flowing through the dam was install a beaver deceiver. So essentially what it is is uh, a cage and some pipes that uh, go through the um, the beaver dam. And we used a uh, um, we used uh, a template by Beaver Solutions and Mike Callahan um, that was free online. So that's how we found out how to uh, construct this beaver deceiver. So here's the beaver deceiver above ground. You can see um, there's a pretty simple mechanism. Uh, there's a cage and then those pipes um, are kept inside the cage. They go through them and they're held up by these uh, uh, stakes. So depending on how high you want the water to flow on the upstream end, that's where you set up the pipes. So if you want uh, low levels of water, you'd set them at a lower spot. Um, higher levels, you'd set them up at a higher spot. But we wanted to test it out there right straight in the middle. Um, so, so the beaver doesn't cap off the so it doesn't um, block the flow of the water. We capped off the ends of the perforated pipe. And there's some holes right under um, these caps and along the perforated pipes that allows water to go through uh, without the beaver noticing that there's a, a leak in its dam. So there's a picture of the pipes going through the dam. Uh, what we did was clear up some of the dam and put the pipes through there. And then uh, you can see the, the pipes going through the dam uh, and the cage on the upstream end. Once it's set in place, you just cover it up uh, and try to pretend nothing happened. And uh, <laughs> hope it... Yeah, you know, it's a smart guy. But yeah, so this was the first beaver dam installed at the the inlet, and it's still uh, allowing water to go through. So it does a good job at um, allowing the water to flow through without the beaver noticing it. Uh, we realized that um, the four inch pipes weren't pushing as much water as we'd like um, through the beaver dam. So we added uh, a 10 inch pipe to supplement the flow and uh, that's how it looks installed in in the beaver uh, deceiver. And it, it seems to have helped. Uh, we have a much better flow going through the, the beaver dam. So none of this could have been possible without the help of uh, the community. Uh, the Rio Bosque is only staffed by two people, just John Sproul and I. Um, but we have lots of partners and lots of support from, from CIRM, um, the Friends of the Rio Bosque are crucial at our success uh, with fundraising events and uh, their participation during the community work days. Uh, the Insights Museum also uh, brings down a lot of students from different school groups uh, in El Paso to work on stewardship projects at the park. Um, so they get a lot of work done at the park as well. Uh, the Frontera Land Alliance always has a um, strong support for the Rio Bosque. Uh, they always bring out uh, tons of community members and have different types of events that uh, highlight the park and their expertise. So we have a community work day uh, every third Saturday of the month, except December. Um, so if you're interested in joining us for one of those, we have different projects throughout the year. Uh, we usually work seasonally. So depending on what has to get done, uh, that month, we'll, uh, we'll work on that. Uh, this weekend, we have a special community work day where uh, I'll take the opportunity to invite you right now, um, where there will be a lot of uh, events, like a water sampling workshop at 8.30, um, a walking together with movement activity by Alison Nora and Melissa, 
Um, you'll also have the opportunity to uh, write a uh, birthday card to the Rio Bosque since it was its first 50th anniversary. And we'll also be installing a uh, beaver deceiver um, in one of the dams uh, to increase water flow uh, through the park. So you'll have the opportunity to get your hands dirty and uh, get into the old river channel and install a beaver deceiver if you're interested in. Um, yeah, and that concludes my talk. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Sergio. And this is the, the moment where we ask you more questions about the beaver <laughs> and something else. I'm just so impressed. When I um, asked Sergio to, I invited Sergio to give this talk because the work that uh, both Sergio and John do at the Rio Bosque is incredible. Like I I had the privilege of spending a week with, with you guys, uh, basically observing, helping a little bit in 2022 uh while you were watering uh and just the amount of physical labor and effort because they literally move back and forth with buckets of water taking care of of the habitat uh some words that really um stay in my mind after your talk are care patience observation time and um, it's just an incredible example that you're you're setting, uh, of course, for conservation work at the environmental level, but even in in bigger ways and more expansive ways than that. Um, any questions or curiosities, Jerry? Mr. Samaniego, you had that chart up that showed the sources of water into the Bosque. And I was trying to eyeball about how much you're getting from El Paso water utility. And I just stuck 150 million gallons. Would that be about right? Yeah, about. So that'd be about 400 plus or minus acre feet a year. Yeah. That'd be a, a reasonable estimate. Yeah. Um, so how does it feel to rely on machinery in a way of like the Bustamante water plant? Like, how does it feel to like collaborate with something so like mechanical versus like something just more natural? Um, I guess in simple terms, grateful because... If it wasn't for the water being pumped in from the Roberto Bustamante wastewater treatment plant, um, in this time of day, we wouldn't have the natural flows that come from the Rio Grande. So uh, without those external sources of water, um, the Rio Bosque would not exist. I'm curious um, in how much if you took like the Rio Grande all the way from the Gulf of Mexico, you know, to here, um, how much uh, like when you with this sort of it's sort of a this sort of restoration, this you're going back to what it looked like, felt like, smelled like before, right? Are there other parts of the river where this can be done? And are there other projects doing it? And would it be possible, like, if you're thinking in a, in a much bigger picture, would it be possible to do this, like, through, along the entire river? Oh. Um, I mean, if the area received, which if, as long as there's water uh, in the area we're trying to restore, um and willing participants um 
to try to establish the native vegetation and remove the invasive species. Um, I feel like it would be possible. I mean, but it would require a very dedicated uh, group of people and uh, or an organization to um, push that agenda. Um, and uh, we need, yeah, we'd need to have the water available to to uh, use to recover that type of ecosystem. Oh, wow. And, um, I think I can yell pretty loud. So what is considered like wastewater, quote unquote, because you said that we get wastewater from the Bustamante treatment plant. So what's really wastewater? So at the Bustamante plant, um, the wastewater comes from when you flush the toilet, uh, when it comes, uh, whatever goes down the drain after you shower, um, all your sink water, but it goes through a whole process where they clean it up to a certain degree uh, before they release it back for irrigation purposes or for potable water. So uh, it's not safe to drink, but um, I'm constantly being exposed to the water and I, I'm still alive. So, <laughs> so it could be that bad. I'll let you know if anything happens to me in a few years. Oh, yeah. Wow. I really just wanted to hold this, but <laughs> no, I'm really curious. I mean, it's been 50 years. Um, are you planning on branching out? Like you said, you know, the river is pretty long. Are you are there any other projects you're you're working on or expand projects? Um, What's so, the plan? Yeah. So personally, I have. um enough to go around at Rio Bosque. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's always something to do and there's uh um the work never ends at, at the park. Uh but we're always open to new collaborations and uh new projects um that bring back uh historic river valley ecosystems. Is there anything you'd like to see? Uh in terms of you personally, is there something you'd love to see in the long run? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, ideally, like if I'm focusing on the Rio Grande, it'd be uh, wonderful for uh, more people in the community to come out and enjoy the park. And um, the Army Corps of Engineers is also working on uh, hopefully um, investing a lot of money into the Rio Bosque. So hopefully that. Uh, comes true um but they're going to deepen the cells and uh provide a lot of different stuff we don't have at the park right now so um that'd be something good to to look forward to in the future um i just wanted to make the comment because a couple people ask about other similar areas in las cruces there's la macha wetlands and there's a couple of places along the river that IBWC and other community groups are working on uh, that are upstream from here. So there are some others, but also pretty small and pretty uh, localized uh, efforts. But there was a time when the World Wildlife Fund was doing a project in Las Cruces called Pearls Along the Rio Grande, where they were trying to establish a series of of wetland parks like the Rio Bosque, but I don't think there that hasn't been a priority for quite a few years now. But that's when a few of the other ones got established, I believe. Um, since the the theme of the conference is uh, bridging borders, leveraging water for peace, um, and I I want to make um ask a question about um peace and, and conflict at the Bosque. And, and maybe this is a question that I can extend also to Dr. Liz Walsh as the interim director of CERM. Um, I don't want to get polemical, but I also want to get polemical. Um, because to as you as you mentioned, like only you and John actively 
work on a daily basis on such an incredible conservation project. Uh, if you could dream big, what kind of sources would you and John and maybe Dr. Walsh uh, um, request to, to really boost the work and to really maintain the work that has been done and expand it? Um, ideally, uh, more water throughout the year. Um, since like I mentioned earlier, we receive different amounts of water um, throughout the year. Uh, there are a few months where we don't have as much water as we'd like. Um, if we were to have lots of water during growing season, that would really help uh, the native vegetation really take off and um, not give it any type of hiccups. Um, so that's one really difficult thing to ask for, more water. Um, I guess a bigger team would also be helpful. I mean, um, so we could kind of uh, get more done in a single day than um, than than what John and I do. Um, maybe like an interp, um, um, because John and I have to do a little bit of everything to get everything done at the park. So we do the groundskeeping, we do the water management, we do the interpretive. Um, side of the of uh, giving tours to the community and um, school groups um, so maybe a bigger staff um, would take us a little bit further also but water would be water year-round would be the biggest thing of course getting water year-round is very difficult as we heard this morning there's not enough water in our region, period, right? And uh, trying to get allocations for nature, as I mentioned this morning too, is very, very difficult. So the water that we do get um, from the Bustamante plant is critical, like Sergio said, um, and getting more resources to the park. I'll just mention that uh, the water utility does provide part of the salary for John and for Sergio. So they've been very instrumental in be us being able to maintain the staff there. Because the park is free and open to everyone, we don't have any way of generating any income and that's not the purpose of the park anyway. It was never meant to be like making money, but because there's no mechanism for that, trying to get resources uh, from anywhere it makes it more difficult, but we feel strongly that it should be open to our El Paso community because <clears throat> we don't have enough open space and we have very few natural areas left and especially natural areas along the river. Uh, so it's very critical that we maintain this park and keep UTEP involved. Um. So now tackling the first part of the conference title, Bridging Borders, the Rio Bosca is by the border fence uh, and marks the border. Um, you're there every day. Uh, do you have any stories that you want to share or um, have you seen um, what it means to really work uh, and be on a daily basis by the border fence? Um yeah, so um, we constantly see um, just people walking on the other side of uh, the border wall. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing eventually making their way over. So we find a lot of uh, remnants of like makeshift ladders and and uh, um, that stuff that people use to get over the border wall, which is uh, just a huge... Uh, blockade for both wildlife and and uh, and people um so we constantly experience um people uh making their way through the park i mean it's a lot of uh people that cross um it's their first experience in uh in the u.s uh they and they land directly in in rio bosque so um it's pretty powerful to see people uh, um, experiencing Rio Bosque that way. I mean, they make their way through the park and uh, there's lots of border patrol activity. So 
The park is constantly being monitored by the Border Patrol, um, which is another thing we have, I guess, gotten numb to and gotten used to. Um, I see it as being part of the park since we're directly connected to the, the border wall and what is today the Rio Grande. That's very, very long. I just had a, a quick question about, um, you mentioned that you do school groups and things like that. Uh, do you have any like numbers on how many community members visit the park? Um, like on, maybe like on a seasonal basis, like whether it's like the school groups or, or the organizations besides the community days? Uh, so that, that's a tough one. Um, I know John keeps track of uh, the number of people that visit the park on a on a daily basis, but since we're only out there in the mornings, um, it's kind of hard to keep track of exactly how many people um, make it out to the park. Uh, and the way we keep track of that is uh, if we see a car in one of the parking lots, we take that down as uh, one person. So um, who knows how reliable that uh, that is, but that's what we have to work for now. Um, It'd be nice if we get could get a more uh, um, a better way of keeping track of who visits the park. Um, but as far as school groups go, um, it just varies uh, depending on um, which organization wants to bring down a group. Like for example, this year we've had um, already uh, at least one school group per month. So there's been. Uh, three visits from school groups uh, at the beginning of this year. So it just varies from year to year. All right, so Iparra asks, What's been one of your biggest management challenges and what has been one of your biggest success? Uh, a rewarding moment. Um, so one of the biggest management challenges, personally, like I said, when I was covering the mowing the wetland cells portion of it is uh, getting used to, uh, so, so I'm a naturally lazy person, I guess, like everyone is. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't really, I didn't know what I was going into when I started working here uh, a little over three years ago. Um, but mowing the wetland cells during August um, is one of the most difficult things I'd, I'd probably have to uh, say I've done at the park when it comes to uh, um, with the managing portion of it. Uh, because you just have to go in circles with the walk behind mower. Uh, there's no other way around it. We don't have uh, a tractor or a large mower that we can ride and clear the fields that way. It's you sticking to the ground and pushing that mower and uh, wrestling through the vegetation um, until it gets done. Uh, and the reward is seeing the wetland cells completely flooded and uh, being used by uh, waterfowl or um, seeing... Uh, animals drink water from the wetland cells or um, so it's all really rewarding um, seeing that uh, the native uh, animals or, or, or birds making their way through the park uh, use the wetland cells. No. Uh, it, why not? Yeah, no. So currently it's the city of El Paso Park. Um, we're pretty far from making it a national park, but why not, right? A little dream big, yeah. Yeah. I have one last question. This might sound like a silly question, but do you guys ever name any of the animals that you see? No, we were so we were thinking about making a competition to name the beaver. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. We'll be waiting for your submission. 
Do we have any other questions? Otherwise, uh, let's extend again the invite to join us at the Rio Bosque on Saturday. Uh, so you can probably, you might meet the beaver in person. Uh, otherwise, let's thank Sergio Samaniego. And thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And there is another panel at 3 p.m. on um, like tracking uh, global instability through water data. So I invite you all to stay. And thank you so much. And have a great rest of the conference, everyone. And take the food, take the coffee, the tea. Yeah, it's there for you. Thank you so much. <laughs>